join me. Uh, our thoughts this afternoon are entitled to him that overcometh. And as I said, you know, last year we had a revelation study once a month, uh, rock skipping through revelation, which is a difficult task. And we talked about symbols in our first talk. In this one, we're going to talk about overcoming and overcomers. Because when we look to Revelation, there's a number of verses that say, to him that overcometh. In fact, there's eight different verses where that occurs, and seven out of those eight are promises to the churches. And what we notice is there's one promise for each church. Makes sense? You know, in order to get the key, we have to understand what the audience of Revelation is. So just briefly, in Revelation 1.1, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ to show his servants. And when you look at that word servants, it means slaves or servants. So it's clear that it's talking to the church. And that's important because we realize only the church is really going to have a, a good understanding of revelation because of the symbols and because it requires the Holy Spirit in order to really harmonize everything. That's the hard thing. And it's signified or signified. Uh, and so it's going to be done in signs. We've already kind of covered that in our first talk. So it's a message to his elect using symbols. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at these eight occurrences of to him that overcometh and see what are they trying to tell us. Now, I'm going to offer you my thoughts, and I'm sure if David got up, his thoughts would be a little different, or Rick, or Homer, or, and, and that's okay. We're going to try to uh, give you our observations of, uh, of what these things are about. And what you realize, when I looked at all of those verses, and I put all of the symbols in them, once again, this is symbolic. So, we're going to go through fairly quickly these things. And so the, they are symbols or signs. And so the first one we find is a message to the church at Ephesus. And one thing that you'll note, every one of these, it says, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so notice it's churches plural. So it's a, these messages are to specific churches, but they apply to all churches. And so, since we're in the last, the seventh church, we should, uh, you know, take recognition of all of these. So, they're, they're very much built on one another. And so, it's repeated, this phrase is repeated for each of the seven churches. Uh, so, Revelation 2.7, the, to the church of Ephesus, to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. Now, when, when you read this, once again, symbols... Uh, we think about paradise lost, the garden. And remember, there was a tree of life in that garden too, but rather than partaking of it, it was don't partake of it. But this tree of life in the midst of the heavenly paradise will be a tree of blessing. And remember, there was not the knowledge of good and evil. Well, this is saying that the overcomers can use that for good versus what happened in the garden. So with each of these, we'll say this was wisdom. So to the overcomers, it's promised they will have wisdom for blessing mankind. Sounds pretty good. Sounds like a necessary thing. And I think that's a common theme that we're going to see throughout these overcomings is the Lord has got a toolkit here. He's making specific promises on different aspects of things that are necessary for the overcomers to, uh, to rule with him a thousand years and then beyond. Revelation 2.11 to the church of Smyrna. Once again, to all the churches, it's also a message. And this one says, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And what we think is this is a, an illusion of they're going to be received the crown of life, which we already you know, looked at in detail. Glory, honor, and immortality, the divine nature. And that will be necessary, if you think about it, to bring mankind back. It's part of the trust that God's going to give to those overcomers. Wonderful thing. So the second element is they're given the divine nature. He's empowering those overcomers to do what needs to be done. You know, you got to have the tools. So an angel couldn't do this. 
An angel has a spiritual nature, but not the divine nature. So it's necessary. And if we had more than 15 minutes, we'd give you some thoughts on that as well. Next, the church of Pergamos. And it says, to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name will be written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So it's a secret name. But once again, these are symbols. So we think that this is, you know, the hidden manna represents spiritual nourishment. And isn't that going to be necessary that, you know, right now we have thoughts and they're imperfect and we have knowledge and it's imperfect. But I think this is saying this is the hidden manna that will enlighten us to all things necessary. And now this custom of the spirit of this white stone is kind of interesting. When I looked it up, they actually, what they used to do is they would take a stone, they would split it in half, and then they would put their name on it. And they put the name on both halves. And whoever you gave that other half to, they had authorization. They knew who you were, but also they represented you. And this is a new name that is not known. So this is really symbolic. This new name being written is that we are accepted into uh, the Lamb's Book of Life. And so we'll summarize that by saying we're receiving the seal of adoption. You've got the seal and you've got a new name and it shows that you're part of it because God has the other half. Next, the message to Thyatira. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, him I will give power over nations. And so we think this is, you know, indicative of sitting on the 12 thrones and to ruling with him with, for a thousand years. It's authority and all the necessary tools to rule over mankind and bring them back into at one minute or alignment with God. And so we'll summarize that by authority to both reign and to judge. Next, we look at the message to the church of Sardis. Now we're in the third chapter. And so what you'll notice on the first seven is we're going to be in chapters two and three of Revelation, which is appropriate. That's all about the churches. He that overcometh the shame, the same shall be clothed in white raiment and will not, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and his angels. And so here we see the next level which is actual righteousness, which would be expected and necessary in order to do this. And the name is now in the Lamb's Book of Life. That confirms that they received, um, they are to receive immortality. And finally, it's declared in all the heavens. It's no secret. These are not secret rulers. Every one of them is authorized and certified in a way by God. going on. And so we would say this is that that uh, they will be declared and really glorified by God. To the church of Philadelphia, him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of God and the name of the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down from God. And I will write upon him my new name. Okay, now we seem to have multiple names here. We had a name that was in the stone. And that was secret and only known to whoever received it. So that was a new name. And now we're getting the name of God. Well, first of all, to be made a pillar in the temple. Notice it's, it's the temple. So this is not about ruling. This is about the spiritual aspect of it, to be kings and priests. Now we're addressing the priestly part, and they'll go out no more. And the new name, we know that the name of God, and you can think of this like the surname. So I'm Robert Goodman. So you'll have your name that you received, but your surname is the righteousness of Jehovah. And we have that uh, shown to us in a couple of places in Jeremiah, as well as Malachi. And once again, these are suggestions, so it'll be interesting to talk with you and to get your input of where you see slightly different things. But he's going to write upon 
him a new name, and that's going to be written on their hearts. So they will be surnamed Righteousness of Jehovah. And finally, we get to our last church, the Church of Laodicea. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame him and sat down with my father on his throne. And really what we're talking about is kingly authority here will be given. And I, you know, you can think of this like a coronation. It'll be official. Everyone will realize it. And in fact, you know, this may be even looking forward to uh, the kingdom when all mankind will also be aware of it. So they'll reign with Christ, the head and body, the 144,000 and one, right? Now they'll, for the first time, they'll all be immortal beings. So they'll reign with Christ as joint heirs. And so what we see here is they receive all the tools, all of the knowledge, all of the uh, experience that they need in order to carry out their mission. You know, God is the divine economist, and I think this shows it. He's giving them everything that they need. There's not one thing missing. You know, when I was in the work world, the, you always had to work with what you had. You never had enough. You never quite had everything that you needed, and your ability to perform was, can you do it? And what God's saying is he's going to provide everything needed. In his economy, there are no shortfalls. So it's everything necessary to carry out kingdom duties and beyond. Now, there's one more of these overcomings, and that's found in Revelation 21. Remember, we were looking in Revelation 2 and 3. Very interesting. Now, all of a sudden, we're in 21. And as we all know, this is a different time frame, 20 and 20. Well, we're talking about kingdom here. And it's also a different audience. And so this one's different. But it, it's called overcomers. And that's, you know, on the surface is a little perhaps confusing. But we realize this is really, when you look at it and study it out, this is a message about the sheep class that come up. And now they are overcomers. Not in a spiritual sense as the church is now, but in an earthly sense. Because they have to go through a test of obedience uh, to God as well. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So what we're seeing here is mankind as overcomers, when they prove themselves, they'll be restored what? To the restored perfect earth, and they're going to receive all things. They'll receive the dominion that they lost. That'll be resumed on a perfect earth. And so they're going to inherit this earthly domain. And what now they're going to inherit, not to spoil it like we do today, but to live there forever. And then they become part of the family of God. Think back to the garden where, where Adam walked in the garden in the, in the midst of the evening and God talked to him. That's the kind of arrangement that they get back to. Back into, back into at one minute with God. And so we see we have promises to the earthly overcomers that they will in, inherit a restored perfect earth and that they will regain that paradise lost, the relationship that they had with God. And so when we look at this, we see two things, right? We have in the first seven overcomers promises to the church the faithful, the elect that overcome. And then we have promises that we today can profess to the world. Isn't this the gospel of the kingdom going out? Now, who's going to understand Revelation? The church. And so it's our unique privilege to put these things out to the world, to witness to the world. God has a plan and Everybody is in it. 